information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money. And with me on the line from London is Ned Naylor Leyland. Ned is an investment director at Cheviot Asset Manager Management, sorry, and advises a precious metals fund. Listeners can find Cheviot on cheviot.co.uk. Welcome, Ned. Thank you very much, Alison. Pleasure to be here. Uh, firstly, can you tell us a little about, a bit about Cheviot and about the funds that you personally run and oversee? Of course, absolutely. Uh, Cheviot Asset Management is really a sort of um, rebooted old name in the stockbroking world of Lang and Krupacek, uh, which went through various different um, other businesses before reforming as Chibi Asset Management. So we do uh, regular UK private client asset management, but I um, I operate in a sort of slightly independent way from the overall investment process in as much as I, I, I offer a, a more um, active and ex-Sterling, ex-UK investment approach, as well as advising uh, an offshore precious metals fund, which is 50% uh, gold, 50% silver, and the weighting within that portfolio is uh, 40% bullion and 60% uh, precious metals equities. So that sort of gives a, a bit of an overview of what I do and, 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 and the firm overall. Right. So that's interesting. The, the selection of 50% gold, 50% silver, is that sort of predetermined or is that a, a weighting that you personally recommend them? Yeah, it, 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 it's just my own um, view of, of, of how one best invests in the sector. I mean, really, it all came about in as much as I, I didn't think there was anything available which really um, uh, provided the right balance between potential appreciation and protection. Uh, for high net worth, you know, relatively sophisticated investors, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably more of a, a silver bug even than I am a gold bug. I, I think both are fantastic, but I think the upside in silver is particularly obvious. So I think that if you're going to be invested in the sector, you ought to have a very substantial weighting towards silver, particularly as they, they do trade in sympathy. And if we're imagining gold's going to go up, silver will likely go up more. So I think it's a, a pretty natural way to go about it. Although I will admit. Um, you know, this is quite a unique approach, which, which to me I find uh, amazing, considering how obvious that is as, a, as an underlying idea. That's, uh, yes, I, well, I would agree with you. I mean, it just seems to me that uh, if you're bullish about something, then uh, you want to buy the more volatile or go overweight in the more uh, volatile route to, to get you there. Uh, absolutely. I mean, silver is, is obviously, it is different. You know, the dynamics of um, above ground supply is, is, is very different but um, you know like you say if, you, if you're going to be invested because you believe the sector is going up you might as well own the one which is going to go up more or um, you know relative to, to the other one I mean it clearly it's also fair to say that but in the downdraft like the sort of correction phase we've had 15 months or so um, silver will come off more so you need to be you know be, be, be a big boy and be aware of what you're, what you're doing but um, I think overall that's probably the right approach yeah. Um, if I can, I'd like to come back to other topics concerning gold and so on in a moment. But um, the general economic background uh, seems to me to be one of heightened systemic risk. Yet uh, gold and silver have really been um, correcting or consolidating for about a year now. Uh, and one would have thought that you would see a bit more interest in, um, in, in, in bullion given what is happening in the wider world. Um, what's your take on this and how do you see the investment management community? Um, you know, why are they not embracing gold and silver? Are they likely to? Uh, it's a wide ranging question, but I'd be very interested in your views. Of course. Um, well, I think my view would be that, that this relates to dramatically dropping volume and the fact that people are very, very cautious and, 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 and confused on, on a general basis. I would sort of tend to argue that the gold bug is less confused. I think we're fairly sure we, we, we think we know what's going on. But um, across the board, obviously, volumes have been going down, which means that the algorithms and, and the robots control much more which way markets trade and, and, and the, the extreme correlation thereof, um, I think that it, it, it's quite obviously the case that political statements, political comment 
is uh, both supporting the market and helping it to um, uh, range trade at the moment. So I think that the, the gold and silver prices seem to be operating within that overall uh, algorithmic correlated matrix. Uh, until you have moments where there's a, a, a genuine sense of panic on a sort of day on, a, on an intraday basis, you can see um, over the last 12 months. Uh, days where the market goes down and gold and silver go up strongly. And, and I think it reflects the fact that what's making the market move, in my opinion, is uh, the computers until human beings sort of actually push the button and get back involved. And at that point, gold and silver seem to do what they ought to be doing, which makes people a, a little more um, sanguine about the correction phase and about where we are within the overall trend. Because I think that um, particularly in August when everyone is away, you know, all the politicians disappear and go and um, play in their paddling pools, whatever it is they do, uh, it seems the market's less supported by political rhetoric, at which point um, I think we're likely to... I mean, there are lots of reasons why I would imagine we're likely to see a big rally over the next few months anyway, but um, I think that the, 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 the way that the markets operate relating to algorithms versus human beings is at the core of it. Yes, um, I, th I think that analysis uh, I would agree with entirely. I mean, from my experience, the stockbroking, I remember how frustrating it was when everybody seemed to shut up shop and go on holiday, I think from more or less Henley onwards <laughs> in the UK. Um, the, I think the, if I can sort of add another point uh, to algorithms, computer-driven and all the rest of it, it's we've seen from the LIBOR scandal that markets actually um, are probably a very, very mucky place to operate in. They seem to be very, very much interfered uh, one way or the other, either by the authorities encouraging banks to interfere or by the authorities themselves. I mean, we know that the authorities continually operate in the uh, foreign exchange markets, but that does seem to extend now to virtually everything it is would you support that view oh without any question of a doubt i mean i've, I've been for a very very long time r ranting on about the um the corruption and the, and the way that markets are structured i think an interesting analogy would be to say you know so even back in in when i first got in, involved or, or, or was reading gatter and, and, and the work that they do and and that you guys do i suppose the analogy would be it's like watching a child or a 13 year old consume two treasure chests full of the nastiest sweets you can possibly imagine. And, and, and standing there and saying, you know what, that's probably not going to end well. Um, it may take a little time to manifest, and we've now got to the point where, where, where the spots are a bursting force all over the face of, of, your, of your teenager based on the sweets he's been consuming. And yes, I think it's across the board. It seems to be um, very interesting and, and I think exciting for those of us that, that have a, you know, a view that we would tend to agree on, on most things about what's going on. I think it's very exciting to see what's happening at the moment because it just, it's just a case that a lot of what we've, we've known and observed for a long time is now coming out to the public. There's a definite, there's a definite change in culture uh, amongst the media now, which is, which is I'm delighted and surprised in equal measure to see that they're, they're actually sort of waking up to what's been going on for a very long time and they seem much keener to investigate. So... I think that there's um, going to be a whole load more of these uh, inverted commas scandals to emerge. They were always there, and, and it's just the case now that people want to know about them. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's right. And um, moving on slightly, Europe, I find, um, is an interesting one. Um, you know, it's quite clear that a number of countries in the Eurozone are bust, and it's very hard to see how uh, even more disasters, more bad news is uh, going to be avoided from that front. Um, yet the, there is, seems to be very little sign of the Europeans um, moving into Euro, it, it, out of Euros into gold. What they tend to do, I think, is move money from bank, account in, bank accounts in dodgy jurisdictions to um, Germany or Luxembourg. Um, do you think that's likely to change at some stage? Well, I think, I'm not sure I would agree with you completely. The reason why I would say that is, is uh, for a period of a, over a year now, I've, when I've met people from the World Gold Council, when I've spoken to, you know, the, the, the high-end trading people that I know, they're saying that Euro gold is incredibly well bid. In fact, the, the, the demand for physical, you know, bought in Euros is, has been very, very strong. So I think it's a difficult one to define specifically, but I do think that... Um, 
the Eurozone is clearly a, a big concern. I think the thing I, I always try and keep an eye on is the community and the traders. And it, it's you know, certainly the case that the um, the big banks are effectively very long euro versus the dollar at the moment, and all the the retail and, and speculative community are, are looking at it the other way and expecting a big rally in the dollar versus the euro. So that tends to make me a little suspicious of what may or may not be going on. But I would also make a couple of additional points about the euro. One would be, you know, it's not worth one cent of its original purchasing power, unlike its cousins, the dollar and, and sterling. So that's one point I would make. And so although the the structural problems on the surface are, are manifestly worse, I would tend to suggest that underlying it, there, are, there may be things aren't quite as, you know, assuming that they can wedge through, um, uh, you know, more centralization, which frankly I would be blown away they weren't able to do, seeing as it's been this long going process since the Treaty of Rome, that that would, you know, carry on happening. Assuming that took place, I, I think that um, the fact that the, 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 the ECB has these gold reserves from, from, from um, member states when they join, and also the, the, the clear movement towards further loans being backed up by um, the gold reserves of member nations, and, and that sort of basically falling under the aegis of the ECB as a way of uh, supporting the currencies. I'm probably not as bearish as some, although short term the problems look terrifying, and um, you know one wonders whether. You know, people pulling money out of the banking system, or rather reallocating it, as you're suggesting, will lead to a problem that the authorities are unable to control short term. I, I think that has to be on the menu. Um, it's a very complicated and interesting subject, and, um, you know, I, I don't think my view would necessarily be any more valid than anybody else's state to say that I'm not perhaps quite as bearish as some. So it's watch this space, I suppose, really. Um, changing, changing tax slightly, I was interested to notice that um, in America the banking community have um, been asked to uh, give feedback to the regulators about the introduction of gold as collateral with no haircut. I found that a very, very interesting development. Um, is that something that you're watching? Do you think it is important? Well, I think it is. It's obviously fantastic news. It's, um, I mean, the idea is that the gold, the physical gold, wouldn't be a cash equivalent. Yeah, uh, already yeah. is utterly bizarre. But 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 not in the context of what you and I know about how these things are managed. But I think it, it's very interesting that this has all been driven by the IMF and the World Bank, who've been stating that balance sheet shrinkage is a huge problem. They need more um, risk-free uh, assets, and gold is a natural one to join. You know, triple A rated paper, and I think. It, it, what's exciting about this is this is beneficial to the banks and the gold investor, and I can't see, think of anything else that's been uh, like that since you know first investing in the, in the sector. I've never come across something which which sort of benefits both sides. Um, I think we'll have to it's, again. It's a sort of a bit of a watch this space type of thing. But there are all these moves in the background are, are um, you know fantastic in terms of reformalizing gold's role within the financial services system. Um, you know, we've got this this RDR change in in the UK to do with the IFA community, whereby you know they're they're, they're far less able to uh, generate commission on on the um, things they're buying for their clients, which will tend to also change the risk reward um, <laughs> in the key part being the reward for IFAs, uh, you know, of, of investing in the sector and, and the amount of money that's what that swishes around in, in, in the IFA community is absolutely enormous. So I think there are a number of things going on which is supporting the further bids being put under the market. But clearly if the banks are not net sellers and in fact want to be buying physical um, for their tier one uh, or rather for their risk-free um, asset basket, that's fantastic news. And um, yes, one would imagine that it would be very, very important. I think probably the bigger issue here is is in what form? So, you know, when one, when push comes to shove, how um, well custodied and how, you know, what are, the, what are the exact terms of what would qualify and what wouldn't? And I think that would be crucial. Uh, my reading of it was that the uh, regulators are going to insist on um, allocated, clearly allocated and accountable gold bullion um, as only uh, being able to qualify uh, uh, for uh, risk-free haircut less um, 
uh, collateral. So I, I think I think this could be a major development. I mean, it seems to me that it's part of a number of one of a number of things um, which look as if, in the longer term, the authorities are beginning to, um, if you like, let go back into uh, the currency system. Um, so I would take it as a positive. So I think we can probably agree on that. Of course, no, no, I completely agree. I just think I'm just sort of sort of raising the the issue of sort of skepticism as to what you know what 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 really goes on in the bullion banking system, even even allocated within the LBMA system. I think is it needs it needs some um, you know it needs the uh, microscope to be shone on it. And I think that maybe I think what I'm saying is I think that this formalisation process can help to to throw more light and more transparency on the overall bullion banking system. Even Jeff Christian the other day in a radio interview stated that he thought that, that most people who owned unallocated gold didn't really know what they owned, um, which coming from, from him I thought was a rather amazing statement. And it just sort of goes to reflect that I think that that's a subject which is going to be on the menu at some point in the next 12 months. I don't know how long it will take, but it's sort of, I think, moving that direction. Yes, yes, no, that's good. Um, now, the last topic I would like to discuss with you is something which um, I know you have spoken on, uh, on a number of times, and that is China. Um, I think the two aspects of China which are interesting, one is their overall strategy towards gold and silver, um, and the second is uh, their attitude towards things like the Pan-Asia Gold Exchange, which... Um, seemed to be um, in the planning stages and was going uh, along quite nicely and then got rather rather cut out by uh, changes in Chinese regulations. Um, what are your views on China and um, is, is there anything going to happen on the page front or is that a dead duck? Well, um, relating, I, I'll answer it in, in, in two ways. The first one would be the overall strategy, I think, is very, very very difficult to know. I think the Chinese aren't exactly um, big on on delivering their, their strategic thinking to the to the world. So I, I, I sort of almost pass on that. Although I do do accept the the basic presumption that they they know gold is money rather than having a discussion about it. You know they know that's the case. But but related to page, I'll, I'll just quickly refresh where we were with it, which is that that, that it got within an, just a, a few weeks or, or a month or two after I made a fair bit of noise about what was going on there last summer. Um, there were issues, let's say, at that board level within PAGE. So that was the first thing for the international contract about which I was speaking. Um, effectively got blocked internally. Now, there, there seem to be various reasons why that happened, um, none of which looked terribly, uh, um, well, free market oriented, let's just say. Uh, but actually possibly more interesting was the fact that, again, about a month after that, the Chinese government themselves came out and said, look, we're no longer going to allow any gold trading at all outside of Shanghai, um, which, which could mean a number of different things. Maybe it was just taking control of an out-of-control market, which had become very um, uh, uh, broken up within China, and there were an enormous number of um, exchanges in different cities all over China, which they, I think they felt they were losing control over. But, but the people who were, who were doing the uh, international fully allocated spot contracts within PAGE, which is really the interesting part of it, um, took off and have been effectively constructing the same thing uh, in silver rather than gold because they, the, the new rules within China don't cover silver in the way that they do cover gold. So they've gone off and set up uh, a new one whose name I, I'm going to withhold until it's actually live. We, it's, the whole process has taken a little longer than... Um, one would have expected, but frankly, you know, one shouldn't be that surprised by this. These, these things aren't simple, particularly when you're trying to drain the LBMA system of metal to hold it outside of that um, on behalf of investors. You know, you're, you're dealing with a very complicated uh, setup. But yes, the idea will be that, you know, within a month or so, there should be an operating fully allocated silver receipt based in China, which I think can drive... Um, the price discovery mechanism away from the the dubious uh, loco London system, as, as as clarified by Jeff Christian himself recently, as I just said, um, and, and and towards a more fully allocated um, uh, you know system, which I, I imagine over time is inevitable, um, because I think once people recognise the way things work at the moment on a more broad basis, at the moment we're still only 
us very interested gold bugs that are really aware of, of what's going on. But at the margin, more and more people are waking up to the price discovery mechanism as, as it exists at the moment and the opportunity to uh, provide competition. And I, I, I'm, I'm very excited and, and hopeful that that can you know, roll out over the next few months. Interestingly, there's something called the Australian Bullion Exchange as well, which is a gold um, sort of equivalent of PAGE, which is under development too. So I think that this overall move towards fully allocated exchanges, yes, they won't have the liquidity within um, the LVMA bullion banking system, um, but that's not the point. You know, people aren't needing necessarily to shift hundreds of billions of, of dollars on a daily basis, but there are lots of market participants who would like something that they felt wasn't um, a liability of a bullion bank, but was rather fully owned by the, by the investor. Yeah, I mean, surely this, um, I, I, I'm interested you mentioning the Australian exchange. Um, it seems to me that the more of these exchanges that set up basing themselves on fully allocated bullion is just going to increase demand for bullion, irrespective of what happens on the big economic picture. Of course, absolutely. And, and this is what, you know, this is why it's exciting. For me, you know, the, 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 the page thing has been a frustration, but um, I'm, 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 I'm accepting of it in as much as it was always likely to run into uh, problems for obvious reasons. And um, it's no surprise that this, that this has proven to be a somewhat uh, bumpy road. But I think the key thing here, Alistair, is to keep talking about it, keep discussing the merits and the differences between a fully allocated tradable receipt um, you know, with, with allocated bar numbers, etc., versus the existing system. And, what, um, and you know, it, it sort of drags um, the uh, inevitable improvement in the structure of the, the bullion markets towards us um, by educating people and opening this up as a discussion um, because, because people don't want to be um, a creditor of an insolvent bank. They want to own real metal. Yes, exactly. Um, well, Ned, that's, that was very, very interesting, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think our listeners will find that um, they gain a lot from this podcast. So, on behalf of them all, thank you very much indeed. Not at all. It's an absolute pleasure, Alison. We'll do it again at some point in the future. Absolutely. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.